Hey there, welcome to the What's Your Thing podcast, where we're all about great conversations with interesting people. That's right, I'm Brennan. And I'm Caitlin. There's something awesome about every person, a thing that makes them truly unique. We want to know what it is about everyone, so we're asking, what's your thing? Roger Damon Price is a prolific writer, producer, and series creator. He has created 19 different TV series that have been produced for various networks, including ITV, BBC, CTV, YTV, Super Channel, Nickelodeon, PBS, and CBS. His best-known creations for kids include the tween drama series, The Tomorrow People, which has since been rebooted twice for Nickelodeon and The CW. Roger created, wrote, produced, and often also directed the prolific, one-of-a-kind youth series, you can't do that on television. This series was specifically designed to make the child viewer feel better about themselves, and it often used subtle reverse psychology to get important messages to kids and improve their self-concept. Roger believes that writing for children should involve children. He was one of the first ever people to involve children in the writer's room. We are honored to have such a true innovator and advocate for children and children's mental health. Roger, in your own words, What's your thing? Hello. Hello. Roger Price. Very, very, very Hi. honored to have you, sir. Thank you for being on My the pleasure. What's Your Thing podcast. We um, unfortunately are missing my sister tonight. She's dealing with the back to school flu that she got from her kids, but she is uh, she is listening and she was able to set this up. I'm very honored to have you on as our one of our first guests um, to our podcast and I guess we should give maybe a little bit of an introduction as to what we already spoke to. A television producer focuses on, you know, children and entertainment. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, we might as well get right into it. What's your thing? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm, as you say, I'm a TV producer, but, you know, you go into TV or something like that because you're young and you're idealistic and you're going to change the world. And I was... Uh, working on a news magazine show that is a 45 minute show which went into things in depth following the 15 minute national news and a young reporter and i were on our way to expose the pollution of a the lake district is a real is britain's main beauty spot and there was pollution there being caused by a a, a big international industry and we were on a way to expose this and put a stop to it. And we were, in those days, you had a, a film crew and that traveled in two large station wagons. Uh, the sound and lights and PA in one behind and the two, the cameraman, his assistant, the reporter and myself in the back seat of the camera car. And we were having our conversation about how we were going to bring this big international company down to its knees. And then we get there and I say, okay, uh, let's put the camera here and we'll start with an establishing shot of this beautiful lake. And the assistant cameraman says, they had Northern accents. They worked for Granada Television, which is in the North. Well, actually it's all over England, but it's based in the North. Would that be anywhere near like Carlisle? Yes, exactly. Only reason I know that a chum of mine is from Carlisle, and he's uh, uh, way up north. He said, he's... "Well, Carlisle is very near the Lake District, so he would know what I'm talking about." And I say, "We'll set the camera here, and we'll do an establishing shot of the of, of the beautiful lake, which is being ruined." And uh, the assistant cameraman says, "Isn't that a coincidence? Didn't we put the camera here the last time we exposed this story, and we're going to put a stop to it?" No, no, lad, says the old cameraman. <laughs> Last time we started on the other side of the lake. It was time before that, or perhaps the time before that. I don't know that we've been exposing this story and going to put a stop to the pollution. Uh, what do you want to do next? <laughs> In other words, you two young fucking idiots. I was about <laughs> 20, 24 or 20. He was about 26. And I'm going to change anything. And basically, you don't. Yeah, that's that's kind of depressing. What year would that have been? That's because that's you were originally from the UK. I, that was in the UK. I, I was born in the UK, and then uh, my 
parents weren't very happy with the UK after World War II. It was full of shortages and regulations and things. So we went to live in Italy. Oh, really? I think they were sent to live in Italy. My mother confessed at a later date that they actually were agents for British intelligence. But, um, really? And certainly that answered a lot of questions and mysteries. Whoa. Do you have, um, is there any information you can get on that? Or is that one of those things that's locked in the vaults forever? I lived through it and everything flips into place once you figure that out. Wow. So you've, uh, um, you're well-traveled, well-lived around the world, would you say? Or? Not really. And, and uh, then I went to a boarding school in Switzerland. Oh. And every other kid in that school was, was German. But what happened was that so one of my father's acquaintances was sending his daughter to a school in Switzerland. And on the other side of the valley was a boys' school. She was at a girls' school. That's how it was in those days, particularly with boarding schools. I mean, and you know, they had dances occasionally with the boys. And we got the address and this school was in the French part of Switzerland. And Switzerland's like Canada. It's a bilingual country, French and German. Oh, I love your cat. And yeah. Sort of and, and I'm saying you got the dog here and this guy, he just loves to be on the calls. <laughs> right. So I, my grandfather had had a business in Paris until just before the war. Literally. Really? Actually, he got out of Paris as one end side as the Germans were coming in the other side. <laughs> him and my mother, who was working for him, and she spoke fluent, uh, pretty good French. I was sent to stay with his ex-secretary in Paris for a month to learn to speak really good French. I already had quite good French. And th I, that was mostly done by her going out to work during the day and us being together in the evenings and me hanging around in a park, in the play apparatus in a park, <laughs> talking to French kids. But I arrived at the school, rang, I got, you know, in those, in, nowadays if you send your 12 year old to catch the school bus on the corner of the company, you'll be considered a bad parent. But in those days, it was, here's your train ticket, here's your money, off you go. <laughs> well, I guess, you know what? I can't relate to anything even remotely close to being like the post-World War II world. So I guess if you lived through anything like that, you got a lot of faith that you can... Yeah, so I arrive at the school eventually. Uh, I think it was two trains and a uh, and, 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 a, and a cab the cab driver was a bit like why are you taking a taxi and the reason for that was that the mountain railway which left from the same station I walked out of actually had a station about 100 metres from the school which was his first stop so that's why But anyway he took me I rang the bell guy comes to the door it's, it's supper time. All the kids are eating. And I say, Bonsoir, monsieur. Si votre nouvel élève d'Angleterre. Uh, Bonsoir, monsieur. J'appelle Chris Roger. Si votre nouvel élève d'Angleterre. Yeah, but je suis en Deutsch. Oh. Which is a bit like going to a school in Quebec and <laughs> saying, Hi, I'm you know. <laughs> Having learned English specially, I am your new student. I come from Germany. <laughs> oui, mais vous parlez pas français? Oh, non. <laughs> I didn't think a word of it. Um, so I was assigned to two German, uh, to room with two German boys. Who, we roomed together for a, a long time after that, who were ordered to teach me German. No, uh, German good. boys, you know, orders are to be obeyed at all times and without question. <laughs> so, so I learned German in about a week. <laughs> I guess so. I, you, you didn't really have a choice. Kind of <laughs> yeah, right. one of those good, bad situations. It's like, you're going to learn this whether you like it or not, but it might pay off in the long run. Yeah, we'll stop sitting on you when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're 12-year-olds, you know. Um, it's sort of, so, um, and that continued until I... I was 15, 16, and went to a boarding school in England for a year to learn to speak your own bloody language. Because yeah. my father realized that I didn't really speak English very well by then. I was going to say, and your accent's 
quite nice. I've met a few. Uh, I have some a buddy from uh, London, and they can get they can get very different in a short distance, you know. Yeah, well, I probably had a German accent at the time. Yeah. Anyway, the, the headmaster called me in one. Well, we, we come, in one day he said to me, like, you know, you, you you've got to sort of loosen up, like stop standing to attention when you talk to teachers, and 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 become more English. <laughs> And a few weeks after that, I thought I'm fed up with this, and especially fed up with the lack of alcohol because they did give us wine at the previous school. And how old were you? You said? Well, they give twelve year olds wine and coffee and things like that. I think Europe. <laughs> now they can't guns. catch a bus here. <laughs> we had guns too. Oh my god. Uh, well, it's a school subject, guns. It used to be in Britain as well. The, the children's book from the uh, from a uh, British children's book, how to uh, how, how to survive in school or something or how to be top <laughs> in school, and, and it said it comes to the chapter on shooting because shooting was a school subject, and it says this sounds more fun than it really is. Yes, they give you a gun and some ammunition, but they don't let you shoot what you really would like to shoot, <laughs> like the principal <laughs> and the math master. <laughs> uh, but anyway, whatever. Uh, I, and I went to a pub. In those days, you could go to a pub in, at 14 and order wine and, or beer, but not spirits. 14 was the drinking age. Like it's, what, 38 in Canada or something? Now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, came back drunk about 15 minutes after curfew. And the first person I encounter when I'm trying to sneak back into the school is the headmaster. He says, are you ill? Oh, you're only drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Can you make it up to bed all right? Uh, yes, sir, I think so. I'm very pleased. You've broken every rule in the book. We're making an English boy out of you at last. Jeez. And then just before we parted for the night, which we did at the bottom of the stairs of where I would stay, he said, uh, which was the same house he lived in, he said, by the way, it's quite serious what you've done. If the headmaster was ever to be told by anyone, he might have to punish you. <laughs> Keep quiet and you'll be okay. <laughs> so I got to bed. Perfect. A little bit of character he, development. He did right? give me one warning. He said, try not to wake anybody. He said, the, the fourth stair from the bottom creaks very loudly, so try to avoid it. I always jump up and down on it when I'm coming to catch you boys doing something wrong. Give you a little <laughs> bit of a warning? So is that, like, what? when did you come to Canada then? I came to Canada in 1979, 3rd of January, 1979. We went to air with the first episode of You Can't Do That on Television on the 3rd of February, 1979. That, that's what I was going to ask you next, because that's that's what you... that Was was that your first big break in production, or was it oh God, sci-fi? Because no. I know you've got, I, you've got some pretty big I, names I, to I, I've credit. Done some, I, I've done primetime documentaries for the BBC. That's where you got your start. I've done documentaries for Granada. I've done... Uh, I already had sci-fi series, The Tomorrow People on British Television. But was uh, the was the, the you can't do that on television? Your first kind of forte for into no, like no, the was you, children's you, you, kit stuff. There was a psychologist, a child psychologist, uh, came in once a I think it was once a week, maybe once every two weeks, sat in an office so that children's TV producers, of whom there were about eight at Thames could go and consult him, but nobody ever did. Because except me, I did. And he sold me on the idea that all of this hi kiddies and stuff is patronizing crap, which I could see was already, because I had children of my own. And you know, uh the children's television at the time in Britain was the similar to children's television as it even is now in Canada. Was it that is special programs for kids and you interrupt something really interesting. Imagine, imagine if, if you did the same thing for adults. You'd go into Hockey Night in Canada and say, hi everybody, tonight we, we're going to spend the next 15 minutes doing an exciting thing. We're going to learn how to file our tax returns and tomorrow night we'll learn how to stop at stop signs. <laughs> Isn't that fun, fun, fun? We'll come back to the game eventually. I mean, 
they think kids want this crap. Anyway, this guy said he sold me on the idea that you make children feel better about themselves. That stuff makes them feel worse about themselves. The first attempt at that was, you must be joking. Because I pitched the idea to the head of Thames Television. And, and he, I said, I want to take a bunch of kids, not professional child actors, but street, kids from the street, and have them write and perform their own comedy show with my guidance about things that trouble them. And he said, you must be joking. <laughs> And I said, that would be a good title for it. <laughs> uh, so that was your pitch meeting. He came he up with the name of it for He gave me the money for a pilot. So we got into, I got the kids and I got into a studio and we were making the pilot. And we did the, in those days, you did a dress, re, you did rehearsal, dress rehearsal. Everything, everything was done live or live to tape. Uh, a dress rehearsal, but. After the dress rehearsal, there was an hour's break while the technicians fine-tuned all the equipment. Okay. And then you did the show, almost live to tape. And after the dress rehearsal, the phone rang in the control room. And it was the head of Thames, Jeremy Isaacs. And he said, I've been watching your little show on, on, on the internal system. Uh, and I really don't think you need to bother recording it. Um, and I don't know, I'm not sure you've got time, actually, because you've still got the Tomorrow People to do, and you have to write and produce and direct that. And it was their most successful children's show on the network. And besides, I, I called up all the other network people, all the network people, and they've been watching it too. And we want you to go to air in six weeks with a series. Do you think you can manage that and keep doing wow. the Tomorrow People? So that was <laughs> that was the break. That was, so we did it, and and it had scenes like um, oh gosh, kid is watching television, watching a, a, a violent fight on TV, you know, like like you see all the time, and he'd say, "Go on, I can't want to punch you on the nose, kick him in that balls," and and the mom comes in and says. You know I don't. I, you know I don't want you watching all that violent stuff on television. And starts to knock the kid about, <laughs> and the kid says, "Mom, but mom, mom, we're on television." And then we see the cameras around them, and she goes, huh? "Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I'm not normally like this, you know. I'm just having a bad day." <laughs> I've not been very well recently. <laughs> and in other words, it's, it, it was that kind of thing. And, and, and that was what got us our network show. And then we did one about uh, the, the, we, we, the discussion at the meetings that we needed a show that would, was for girls. And everyone came up with the usual cooking and dressmaking shit. Yeah, just a classic. And I came up with one. I said, what about Rawker's comedy about boys and sex and pop music and stand-up comedy all from kids. Okay, off you go. The birth of like Teen Vogue. And that was a, that was, a, that caused a bit of a stir. Every male critic hated it. The male critic of the Times newspaper roundly condemned it as outrageous. And the following day, the leading female columnist on the Times newspaper called her male critic colleague a misogynist bastard. In really? The time and said that it was the best show for girls ever made. And that he just didn't get it because he was an insecure male who was worried about the length of his penis. Or something <laughs> like she really like slammed into him. And... Well um, then Jeremy Isaacs decided we needed to do the same thing for little kids. And he said, go out and find some little kids. And I said, because I was busy, I said, you can't be serious, Joe. He said, oh, and we'll call it that this time. And you can't be serious was you can't do that on television with British accents. And but then I came over. I, I, I had meantime, I had met someone, people from Canada. And, and the, the problem with Canada was that they were making kids shows with lots of government money poured into them and the kids weren't watching them. They wow. weren't even getting enough kids to measure, which meant less than 2000 coast to coast. Really? And would I come over to Canada and make a children's series? And I thought, well, the only thing they can afford to do and the only thing that 
and I can pull together quickly, is a version of the British You Can't Be Serious. You can't do that on but, television. And I showed a scene from that in which a, two, a little boy and a little girl are sitting in a movie theater and he's eating his popcorn. Well, they're not, they're not that little, they're 12 year old. And she says, to, you sh something you should know, Mikey. Yeah. What? It's not interesting. I've not got a bra on. Well, neither have I. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yes, this is children's television. Oh, my God. <laughs> How because children, I like that. And the Canadian executive says, who sees this scene as an example of the sort of thing we're going to be doing, says, you may get away with that sort of thing in Britain, but you can't do that on television over here. I was going to say, like, By even like, that's, yeah, Canada especially, like, I've, I've seen, like, I, I like some, there's some British stand-up comedians, especially, like, there's some crass ones that I think are pretty, pretty funny. But, yeah, that was especially government money, 2,000 people. Like, hey, that's taking a risk. Because that, that was what I wanted to ask you is, like, you obviously had Jeremy seem to be supportive. And then this woman came out and she wrote the article. Because that's got to be, you dropped a big ball on, like, I guess, what, posh kind of like what we expect of children but then versus like you're changing culture you're changing society you're kind of bringing them i guess what they are but showing it on tv did you get a lot of pushback in, in england or was yeah, it more canada things too like in britain same as here there weren't any black kids on tv so i found some and put them on tv um was that kind of like at the time were people like eh, a little risky or was it because it was just the, the society? The audience won't like that. it. The advertisers won't like it. The audience really? didn't care. The advertisers loved it. Because that's what I mean. In any way, if you don't let me do that, I won't make the show. And you had that. There was something you. important about my shows. They got fucking good ratings, almost whatever they were. And you know what? You're changing it for something because, like, you know what? Let's say there is somebody who's like a little black kid that wasn't on TV. They're going to see themselves and they're going to see people, you know, part of their community yes. represented. That's awesome. Well, and on You Can't, I used to try and have a boy who was effeminate in his body language. We never said this kid might be gay. We never said there was anything wrong with him at all. It's just that he was a little bit effeminate. And super progressive in that sense. The and last one has grown up to be a, leading, a, a film director in Canada and a leading gay activist. So I guess he was gay. But I didn't say he's gay. He just, we, the other kids just accepted him despite the fact that he was a sissy, basically. Progress. Because... And trying to get these subliminal messages through to kids that you're okay, you're not the problem, the grown-ups are the problem. And did you're they give the you a problem, the grown-ups? Especially you, you gave the, the little anecdote about Canada where it's like you can't put that, you might be able to do that in the UK. Did it? Did they kind of grow People on it? People were really showed? upset about it at first, but by week four, it was the highest rated show in the time slot. And by week six, the ratings of ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, CBC, Global, and TV Ontario did not match the rating of You Can Do That on Television on CTV. That's unbelievable. And I, so I, when you have that, people don't, you know, oh, the guy's doing something right, and kids were loving it. Absolutely. And then Nickelodeon picked it up, and it moved Nickelodeon from, in, in, in 10 months, it moved Nickelodeon from 2.3 million, it was a pay service in those days, 2.3 million subscribers to 2.6 million, sorry, to 22.3 million subscribers in 10 months. And what year was that? 1982. That's unbelievable. Because you think about um, like what you think access to anything like this right now, like we we got limited to a Zoom call tonight, but we have it at our fingertips. You know, everybody had to watch. You only had so much. You had to have access to TV, and like those are pretty big numbers. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. So I guess they they kind of gave you the leash after that. They were like, all right, you get you know what you're doing. I got on well with the executives, mostly the Nickelodeon ones, particularly. They were very helpful, and we did write some skits, which the. She Brown, the, the executive I dealt with generally, a woman called Brown Johnson, she would call me halfway through reading a skit and say, are you sure about this? And, <laughs> and, and we sent some scripts to New York Courier the day before, knowing Brown would read them first thing on her desk that morning. And she'd get, they came in, in batches. And there was this scene which was just, outrageous even you can't do that on television couldn't do it 
It's kind of like, uh, and yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Brown calls me and I say, Brown, have you read it to the end? No. Well, would you do that now? And she turns the page and the kid says, do you think Brown Johnson has called Roger already? <laughs> I'm sure she has. Yes. Does she realize what day it is? I don't think she does. <laughs> Well, Brown, April Fool was all there in the script. And what did she say to that? She's pretty yeah, good she sense of humor. Got me, but she, she got back at me because <laughs> a couple of weeks later, a month or so later, there were some scenes that we, we always wrote some scenes we knew they would want to take out. So they'd leave everything else alone. And pretty, pretty smart. The scenes we knew that unbroadcastable, that they were going to have to say, you've got to take, you know, take these out. I called Brown and she criticized a few things and said that she this needs rewriting and that sort of I said, like, what, what about the scene of so and so and the scene of so and so? Oh no, I love those. You must leave those in. I have got you back. <laughs> of course I didn't leave them in. I didn't want to. What's your thing, Pod? Like, subscribe, listen. We'll be back momentarily with Mr. Roger Price. The Tomorrow People came was about the next stage of human evolution. And I thought there must be another stage because there were these German kids and me and we were great friends and playing together and living together. And that boarding school was like one long sleepover. Yeah, just a lot of fun. Actually, the German headmaster's attitude has explained it to him briefly. He said, punishment makes a good boy bad and a bad boy worse so we don't punish interesting that you say that that's uh one of the theories i was fortunate enough when i went to university i studied criminology and criminal justice and that's one of the theories is like you know that the, the kids who are severely punished they just learn how to hide it better and kind of get away and it doesn't change yeah, well they, they didn't punish and I, th and I thought you know we're so different from our dads who were trying to kill each other yeah that's yeah that, I mean, my father was horrified when he discovered it was actually German kids at the school. I guess so. But, you know, to, to live with it, Dad, too friggin' mad. But he wouldn't let me wear Lado's on the toe. Really. <laughs> That's what we draw on the line. <laughs> I'm wearing your little Hitler outfit. Oh, know? my God. I guess, yeah. I mean, there, there was a bit of animosity for those folks. But uh, I guess. So the Tomorrow People came about because of the next stage of human evolution. Yeah. Basically, the network people said to me, we, we need something to, to, to counter Doctor Who. And I said, yeah, that's Doctor what. Who, Doctor Who's an old man, so let's use kids. Jolly good idea, do it. I mean, that's how it went. <laughs> it's sort of like. Because <laughs> that's, yeah, so, because that was a very successful sci fi, right? Did you, was that your kind of, were you just kind of like that? Are you a sci-fi fan, I guess, would be the question. Or is no. It, no, not at all. <laughs> but we did try and get some, uh, other people to write it, and the ratings were not as good as when I wrote it. Oh, really? I don't know. I don't, know. I don't I, I, you know. So so I had to keep writing this bloody thing. But it, it's... It, it's... Why would you give a very young guy who hadn't even been to college the job of producing directing television i don't know um and then i was taught when i was being taught how to do live tv it was by a guy named ben churchill the dress rehearsal was absolutely terrible and we were going live and i said took him for a walk behind the control rooms and, and i said ben you're gonna have to take over and he i, I totally screwed it up and he said, no, he, he, he said, what, what will happen if you do screw it up on the night? And I said, I, I don't know. I said, I, it would be terrible. And he said, no, it won't. We'll, we'll have a blank screen for half an hour. People might talk to each other, play with the kids, take the dog for a walk. In fact, it will be good. Let's do it. <laughs> and that's how you teach people. And, I thought, and, and uh, when we were doing the countdown, you know, you, you go through this thing like sort of, you know, five, four, three, network has this roll film. And, and that kind of thing. He just leant, leant over my shoulder and said, it's only fucking television. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and it doesn't. So I, I want you to have that sort of attitude. 
It makes it easier. I, I tempt I sometimes. I like to direct live TV, and the Tomorrow People and other things weren't giving me the chance to do this. But there yeah. was a live to air magazine show, and there was a woman presenter, and she was out in in the garden. They were doing something. It was a traditional children's show. She was out uh, doing doing in the garden, and she was bending over, and she was wearing a very short skirt. And oh, it was no. a bit windy, and uh, the woman. Producing that was a close friend of mine called Sue Turner, and she was just a lovely lady, Sue Turner. And she had been talking about what's well, such a pity that the show is mostly watched by girls, and we need more boys watching, she'd said. And I said, Can you get the camera lower? If the wind blows her skirt up, we want to see her knickers, which is the English word for female underwear. And Sue Turner, the producer, sat behind me, and said, she, she, she said, Girls don't like that sort of thing. <laughs> and I said, "This is these are TV stories." I I, I said, "But boys do." And you <laughs> told me this morning that you don't have enough boys watching the show. That's and that. That's one said, way. That's <laughs> yes, you're right. And then she leaned over my shoulder to use the talkback microphone, and which she's not supposed to do when you're a producer, and said to the camera operator. Can't you get her that fucking camera any lower? We want to see her knickers. That poor woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, at different times, eh? Back in the day, that's what I was going to ask you. What's uh? How has your perspective changed from from like you know the big 1982? Like you're getting the millions of viewers. How has it changed to what you see now or what you're doing now? If you're still heavily involved or? Well, I'm not that heavily involved at all, really. I mean, you're kind of getting getting back involved. But... Getting back involved, and and do you I do you find an NDA agreement yesterday? So hey. that's the problem there. So we will not disclose. <laughs> but uh, do you do you find um, do you find it's going to have like a different set of challenges? Like what what do you think is the predictions for how it's going to go now versus what you saw? Do you think the formula is kind of going to be the same, or has society changed so much in the last little bit that you're you're anticipating a lot of challenge or just you're going to have to approach things differently, maybe? Well, you do single camera stuff and um, you're trying to make it funny, but uh, and I'm not prepared to do anything, which is the whole idea of the show behind every show I've made for kids is to enhance the self concept of the child viewing the show, which means sometimes giving the kids on the show a rough time yeah, okay. because that's part of it. And they're apparently giving them a rough time. We used to pay them a ton of money and then pay them bonuses for getting slimed and things. Um, I wanted to ask you about that. Is it true that you were the inventor of the Nickelodeon? Yes. Slime? That's, that's pretty uh, awesome. Something to take, uh, take with you in your legacy. <laughs> I suppose. Yes. Um, it is, it, it, it is, but it represents the moment, the, our huge, big, biggest to date, most traumatic buried memory, the memory of being born. You lived in a world of red and slime, and then as an aquatic creature, and then suddenly, in the space of a, less than a minute, you come out into bright light. And you have to learn to breathe. That's, Otherwise, you're going to die. That's pretty deep. <laughs> I never... And what you see when you close your eyes again it, is, is you're covered in slime and you, and, and, and you keep your eyes tight shut afterwards. But all you're seeing is green. Really? You look at a bright light and shut your eyes and turn away and you see green. That's pretty cool. So you're, uh, I guess, like we, you're, you're going back into it. Maybe you're still kind of involved. Do you see it change? Do you, do you carry, see it change? Every, everybody carries this traumatic memory, and the next traumatic thing that's going to happen to you, which is and it's happened to me fairly soon, is even more traumatic, and that's when you die. That's so. yeah, that's terrifying. It's something um, that we all have to think about, but it's pretty spooky to think about it well we we train ourselves not to think about a lot of things we like like that and um, me too uh and then you get how do 
you get caught up in traffic, the car, you know, cuts you up and you feel a frisson of anger and you feel you sort of your nerves jangle for a bit, but you have to bottle it up. And that happens to you what? A few times a week. Yeah. Okay. Because you're a grown up, you're a child. You come up against these little psychological self-esteem destroying moments. I've seen the estimate as many as 30 a day. Stop watching that. Don't pick your nose. Switch that off and go to bed. Yeah. Each of those is the equivalent of being cut up in traffic and children have to put up with it 30 times a day. I'm the, I'm the father of a five-year-old. So. Yeah. What? I'm the father of a five-year-old. So you saying that kind of like resonates in the back of my head. You know, how often you have to just, they're doing their thing. You have to interject. And... Well, you don't have to interject. You have to hold your tongue. Well, I respect that. Or, or you have to say it in a friendly tone of voice. Uh, my dogs are not used to hearing that tone of voice. They, they, yeah. they very rarely get told off. People say, how did you train your dogs to be so nice and obedient? The answer is I didn't. I just treated them with respect. That's... I went to a school where a full of boys, where the teachers just treated us with respect. Teachers knocked on the door before they were, came in. They asked you if it was okay for them to do this, that, and they expected you to ask them. That's... Yeah. And... Yeah. It works. It's as simple as that. When you start bashing children around, I don't know. Now, things are worse now in Canada than they were uh, in the 1970s and 80s. Much worse. Do you know what the second largest cause of death is amongst children in this country now? Has been for two years. Is it the... I, I, would, I, I could guess. I don't know if... Uh... I know that there's a significant uh, opioid crisis and then there's self-harm no, crisis. Children. No, I don't. Suicide. That's terrifying. 20.2 deaths of children in Canada at the moment are caused by suicide. That is almost the same figure as the number of child deaths in the United States from gunfire. The suicide rate in the U.S. is low, but not much. And is there, do you think it could be something that, you know, your line of work, you said at the beginning, you kind of. I believe we could, we desperately need a show like you kind of on television so they can laugh at their troubles. I almost wonder if that's kind of, like you said, things are worse off now than they were back then. I find, I don't know if it's just generally culturally across all ages and demographics we live in a much more i guess it's good in the sense that you don't want to hurt people's feelings but we're all much more cautious about how we go about things and say things and do things and and like you said you, you the kids would watch these shows where it's hey how are you blah, blah blah versus like okay this is more real this is i can relate to this do you find uh we've gone we've backtracked towards that there's not enough of what you had but, um Rates of childhood depression, self-harm, etc., have increased twofold in the last two years, 200% in the last two years. The Center for Disease Control in the States, it, clinical depression, severe depression, is, it's, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a diagnosis. 35% of American children suffer from severe depression, and you can bet it's the same in Canada. With severe depression, they can't study, they have eating problems, they have health problems, they can't sleep. This is caused by a variety of reasons, but, you know, I, I, we, we don't know, but there, there are mill millions of reasons. So you think uh, this was a case back then, but we were only talking about, you know, one tenth, which I find so 
puzzling because like even myself i feel like there's so much more of a, a push for mental health out, outreach now versus probably what it was back then and you'd see that's like true. higher rates i don't know that's but, for old people so you think getting something like you can't do that on television back on the airwaves you know something a little more would you say like lowbrow realistic kind of fun fun and 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 realistic i mean we didn't de- Okay, uh, you'll be told by if you try to pitch this by network executives in Canada or the CBC and so on, nobody hits their children anymore. Nobody does in your society. The McMaster University's Montreal, which has a department which studies children in their state. 18 to 42 percent of children are regularly hit by their parents in Canada. Really? Really? That's these are all statistics like I'm, I'm honestly like as ignorant as they and come. What hitting children results in is domestic violence when they grow up. Yep. Do you think there's been an increase in domestic violence? I know that. So um, we're making it. We're, we're screwing our kids up by pretending how righteous we are. Basically, I I, I think that's a, a profound statement in itself because it's it's kind of true. And I do you find like we're also screwing things up by just trying to protect everyone at every facet from every thing that could possibly hurt them. In a sense, you know, like I feel tiptoeing around what we're going the wrong way about it. I don't achieve results with children or adults by saying you must. I, I unless, they, unless they can see the reason for it. I believe that because I, I feel like personally, like I, I find, uh, especially when it comes to like speech and speech you don't like. I, I mean, I'm a fully capable adult of saying I don't like what that person says. I'm not going to listen to them as opposed to saying that person can't say anything. Because I find when people get, if I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but. You have these people who get radicalized. Maybe it's because they find themselves alone and desperate. And then they, everyone's saying, oh, don't listen to that. You can't hear that. That's bad. And then they're like maybe intrigued by it. So they're more likely to go towards it as opposed to if it's just out there and we can all go, hey, those people are silly. Don't listen to them. Leave it alone. I don't know. Kids, probably even worse. They're, uh... Well, children particularly, uh, I'm talking here. Uh tweens because kids go through stages we used to call it the seven ages of man hmm. and maybe we need to come back to you're going to shock me by victorian values in some respects i'm all about or, I, I, I mean, this is what you, hey this in, is what's your thing you're allowed rearing. to say whatever you want i want to i want to hear it we need ideas okay, we need talk child rearing victorian values the one i'm talking about is that the victorians until the children were six or seven, did not really distinguish between boys and girls. Oh, really? Even clothing. Is that why you see that? I, I do recognize that kind of like Victorian era where the, the boys would always be wearing like almost like a white frilly dress kind of thing. Am I, am I making that up? No, you're not. Yeah, I feel like, okay. Because at six or seven, they are ready to start being gendered. That's an interesting case. In being boys or girls. Given given Until today's then, just discussion children. around it, sorry, but what? that's that's an interesting take considering. Like I've never seen it from that perspective. You see a lot of people talking about gender and gender neutrality and and children with that in in context. It's all over the place today, but I've never seen it from the historic perspective. Personally, I've never read that, and that's probably why. Well, it wasn't just the Victorians. It was it, it was for so, several hundred years before that. Really interesting. And. So we don't need to be going on at children about gender and sex. We need to be ignoring that topic entirely. We do not. I mean, ideally, we we wouldn't be. Uh, and, and, and when you expect them to fulfill a gender role and they're only little kids, they're not ready for that. That makes sense. Um, you know, uh, then when they're about six or seven, 
they go through a, a, a brain change practically and they reject everything that they've enjoyed before like teddy bears and all that kind of stuff and they should be allowed to reject it uh, but they're not yet teenagers and one of the mistakes that program makers make frequently is you see teenagers playing the roles of children hmm. children do not identify with teenagers they see a teenager quite correctly as what it is something with the strength of an adult and the brain of a two-year-old <laughs> that's a very that's awesome <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty much what i was when i was a teenager absolutely <laughs> and they're afraid of them and uh but they're not yet ready for sex sex is something that you know they're very insecure about hmm. there's some belief that with in the case of boys who are more insecure about it than girls to a large extent they are all basically gay or homosexual until puberty no what i never heard that one well how often do small boys want to play with small girls no i guess that's yeah it's interesting okay and so you just like accept this you, and don't try and change them and don't try and mold them in, into something. I'm sorry, I'm of the old school. I believe that <laughs> gay people are born gay. I... They're not going to change no matter what you do. Nor are straight people going to change yeah. no matter what you do. And... Do you identify as a gender other than the gender you were born with is a question in various censuses, Canada, the US and Australia primarily. Canada has the lowest number with 0.3%. Australia has the highest number with 0.5%. Oh, really? That is three kids in a thousand are gender dysphoric. I would have thought if it was a lot higher. We go than that. by the by the reporting of adults who say that they were okay. when they were born. You can't ask kids that question; they don't know. They'll look for the answer. They're they're trained to look for the answer the grown up wants. That makes sense. I believe that. Which is why I'm not like I'm, I'm not that fond of teachers saying, "Are you sure you don't want to be a girl?" Yeah. All you're doing is making that kid feel insecure. Well, that's that. My, my... When, they, when they grow older, they're going to get violently the other way. You want to build transphobia and homophobia in kids, try to propagandize them to like it when they're six, seven, eight, nine years old. It's dangerous and it's bad for the gay community and the trans people. And trans kids do need all the help we can give them. Mainly that help needs to be love, understanding, and acceptance. That's, yeah, that's, especially I find we're in an instant media age where everything's just thrown at you. It is very easy to get caught up, and I'm, I'm of it myself, where you read something and you go down this rabbit hole, and the other people, and you kind of, uh, whether you're on one side or the other, you tend to focus on that and then, instead of having a discussion and kind of like listening to the very rational points you just made, you kind of like, I feel people just make their minds up and say like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not listening to that. And it's true. Like, what is it? What did you just say? Love, compassion and understanding is kind of forgotten with all of this and people only kind of. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, I, I, this idea that you can use a different pronoun at school. I mean, People don't use bloody pronouns anyway. I mean, you know, the the, the, the French do. <laughs> There's an American comedian, I'm trying to remember his name, who lived in France for years. And even the French get confused about the gender of devices. Now, I'm probably going to get this the wrong way around, but the machine in the basement which washes my clothes is either la machine à laver, a girl, or 
Le l'arbre Versailles, a gay, a guy, not necessarily gay, a guy. And, you know, I know it'll break down if I misgender it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. That's a, I, don't know, I don't know where I was going with that. But that's, really, hey, it's, it's human pretty funny. beings don't use gender and we, in daily contact and daily conversation. It shouldn't matter in a classroom whether a, a person identifies as he, him, or she, her, because how often do you use those words? Yeah, it's, and yeah, it's, <laughs> that's pretty funny joke. You got me on that one. Um, so is that, and then to tell them to keep it secret from their parents, you are setting up an internal conflict in the child. And that is what leads to, what we were talking about damaging their self-concept and depression and confusion and everything else and so it's a mistake that's all and it's a mistake by well-meaning people who are messing with something they don't understand so why don't they you know try to uh, service electrical devices and things with the power on <laughs> this is about the equivalent when they're messing with the minds of children so would that be coming like in conclusion, like closing, you've, you've explained a lot about where you were and how you, it was groundbreaking, how you took kids out of that kind of classic, what we still see today that, hi, how are you? Like in your face, kind of high tempo, whatever style. And you brought kind of more of a grounded reality to what kids wanted to see. I'm getting the sense that it's kind of dissipated from that. And would you see it, a benefit to bringing it back and kind of like, would would it like what do you see what do you want people to know about what you did and where you can go with I it i want people to recognize that children realize that they are small and defenseless and utterly dependent on adults you can choose who you marry and if you don't like that choice you can separate and divorce but they cannot separate from their parents or their teachers there is no other group in society that has no vo vote but the government compels them to be in a certain place for several hours every day, even if they don't want to be. Then the adults, if they're insensitive at all, and most of us are, will cause sort of little traumas or jolts to kids in the way I earlier described. That's pretty powerful. It's we used to be playing around in school and outside playing. And the teachers never came and said, go to bed. They would come and say, don't you think you should go to bed? You still got to get up at six o'clock in the morning. And it's now 10 and you probably need to sleep. And then they would walk away. Yeah. That's cool. That was how they managed us. And believe me, Within a minute or two, they'd be followed by some disgruntled 12 year old boys going to bed. Yeah. And they didn't even look back to see if they'd succeeded. They were real professionals and it was a pleasure being in their hands. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, that's inspiring. It kind of like, I kind of wish I would have had those teachers, to be honest. Oh, I got to say, my teachers were pretty good. Um, So we've heard a lot about, well, your journey. It's pretty cool. Like all the way from your parents having some pretty cool backgrounds that are uh, unknown but unknown, I guess we could say. And then you you started out, you know, in England, came over to Canada. We know that portion of it, your work with children. What's something about you, if you have something that you'd want to share that people don't know about you that's kind of fun? Is there anything that, uh, you know? Well, I've, just, I've caught the disease that comes with gray hair and a prostate problem i'm interested in model train oh yeah model trains eh so how much uh this, this is something is is it fair to say you can spend a lot of money on that hobby it sure is yes <laughs> when did you get into this hobby you said oh, it's God, uh, about uh, 2008 okay how big of a space do you have for this sort of thing basement a basement there you go now, this is just two minutes. I just did this for a train club meeting, which is coming up on Friday. 
Is it uh, do, the club? Is that all local, or is it kind of people from everywhere? Other oh, people from everywhere, but this is my layout in the basement. It's something that's. Uh, is it very, very, very much like you have to pay attention to detail, right? Are you building like from ground up, or do you buy sections of sets and they're kind of put together themselves? No, we built from the ground up. So it's a little bit of a time-consuming uh, hobby. Yes, too much. So. Really. <laughs> Then you show off your work. I, do the, I, 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 I don't give enough time to it, you know. The, the whole thing took six, it's taken six years so far. To, and this is the second layout I've built. The first one was in France, and I had to leave it there. Are you, would you say you're pretty good compared to the, the other people in the club? Or is there some people that are just like, that's well, their some hobby? People, that they're miles some people above. go in for great detail and never get very far. Yeah, and some fair. people don't bother at all. I'm halfway halfway, I think, really. I just want to get the trains running and get it to look reasonable. Um, some people I've actually seen uh, examples of, of, of this, but the guy has been planning his layout for 10 years. Oh, really? Hasn't begun making it. I just, I built two layouts so far and, and I just started building and it's sort of, comes about it's like a sculptor you know when they just chip away at a block of marble and the statue comes out of it do you find it mentally like relaxing do you find it kind of a mental health break just oh god no it's it, everything goes wrong all the bloody <laughs> time things like that it's just uh my wife bought my, my uh, main activity is walking the dogs and writing and yes that's writing pitch things and stuff like that well that's uh, is there anything you wanted to uh kind of put out there like as a plug that uh, going on especially you've spoken a lot about mental health is there anything you'd want to share with respect to that for kids maybe like outreach yeah, but you, uh, I, I don't know what the situation is with robin but we are trying to persuade canadian television to get back to making something which is kid centered on the side of the child and not on the side of adults yeah which assumes that children need to be reassured and entertained rather than educated and improved. That'd be awesome. Yeah, it'd be and nice to see that come back. It would be nice to see that come back because it does seem to me that the people currently involved in gatekeeping or I've actually seen a show on a channel aimed at tweens, which took a little bit of time out to teach them how to tell the time when the big hand is pointing at. That is insulting. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so I, I I was the last of like my grandmother had a rotary phone. And I don't think my son will ever know what that is unless he goes to the Museum of Science and Tech. You know. Yeah, they they don't need to be learning that stuff. And anyway, it's insulting to assume that they don't know. Yeah, something more every grounded. Every child in their that does know is insulted, and every child that doesn't know is in, you know. I mean, it, and it's worse when you get children doing it. Children on the screen telling the children at home. The children on the screen must appear to be worse off than the children at home and more stupid than the children <laughs> at home. This is what you're supposed to emulate. Well, this, this, these, are, these are my basic ground rules. The children on the screen are treated worse than the children at home almost could possibly be. Yeah. And the children on the screen are particularly stupid. <laughs> well let's hope that uh let's hope that that gets back into it like you get this maybe something gets I on the ground there, running. yeah i'm as part of the pitching process there's there's the scene from the very first show over here hi this is a totally new kind of show made by canadian kids for canadian kids cut <laughs> what what is it now cut makeup yeah what now says the makeup girl that's funny. Which her nose. <laughs> oh, I can't do anything about that, schnocker. I'm not a plastic <laughs> surgeon, you know. <laughs> well, just make the best of a bad job. Powder it. Um, <laughs> so meanwhile, there's this girl, this kid is between these two adults who are just turning, you know, and she's supposed to be presenting a TV show made by kids for kids. And these two adults are discussing her nose <laughs> in a very disparaging way. Uh, that's in the first 30 seconds. 
And some kids at home are going to be saying, oh, God, it's another... No, it isn't. What the hell's going on here? That's exactly like my grandmother. <laughs> Perfect. And so, you know, that that's um, that's basically the approach. It, 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 and yes, they suffer terribly, apparently, you know. I mean, it's... Yeah, all they'll have fun with it, though. I mean, it's... But we did things like well, it came out that they were really well paid because they were for, paid for American TV rates. And, and I took them to an actor function and every all these adult actors were going past the table looking daggers at these children. And I realized afterwards it's because they'd read in the newspaper that they were the highest paid actors in Canada. Perfect. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> so we out of that came a skit where Ross, the, the floor director is called Ross, and his first, second name is Ewich, so you just say Cricket's Ross Ewich. And the producer of the show was Mr. Soul, and his first name was Roger, but he only had his initial on the back of his chair, Mr. R. Soul. <laughs> and so on. And so, so Ross, Ross comes on and says, you kids are always saying that you have to work hard, uh, just like uh, grown-ups, and you but you're not allowed to do any of the things that grown-ups get to do. You can't smoke, you can't drink, uh, you can't vote, you can't... But we found something that you, the grown-ups, all, all grown-ups do, and we're going to let you do it too. Oh, yes, what is, what is, what is it? File a tax return, fill in these forms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of like... So that even the kids who are highly paid are sort of they get to file a tax return. They also already talked on the show about how the, their parents keep the money anyway. And and we did we come out and say things like, you know, it's a um you may think that in Canada today children don't go out to work. Well, you're looking at some that do. Because we're working right now. Yeah. But not like adults. Adults work eight hours a day. No, we're just kids. So we work nine hours a day. <laughs> well, that's until you're 12. Then the work day is 11 hours. Mind you, there are laws to protect children. And yes, uh, you can't send very young children out to work. A child has to be at least 14 days old before they can be sent out to work on te in a TV show or a commercial. And then a girl says, yes, my, it was very frustrating for my mother having to wait whole two weeks before she could send me out to earn money. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. So you begin, the children at home watching are not, I mean, everybody else is like, oh, we're stars, we're happy, yeah. we're wonderful. And these kids are like we're exploited, we're overworked. <laughs> we're... <laughs> I like that, and, and so on. Uh, It'll be refreshing. That... It'll be refreshing if that comes back for the kids, especially like you know the ones that are kind of dealing that with. Started in the very first season of the British TV. The, 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 there was a young black reporter who did news stories. And he did a new story about children being working in a factory and being exploited. And the smallest kid on the show said, who's actually a drummer with the band as well as being one of the actors, says across calls across the studio and says, I know a place where really young kids get to work 12 hours a day, which is a rule in Britain. But being kids, they only get paid half as much as adults. And the reporter kid was a black kid, actually. And he, he said, that's terrible, Mike. Where is this dreadful place? Taking his notebook out. Uh, the little boy says, here at Thames Television on the <laughs> show. Oh, yes. Moving on to another story. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's sort of like, because I want the kids to, at home to realize that there is no escape from childhood. It's the yeah. prison you've got, yeah, that you eventually get out of. But uh, that's a beautiful message. Well, they're, they're not. It's not the. Do you, do you have a happy childhood? Well, at ups and downs. I I got to say, looking back, there's challenges with everyone. But uh, yeah, 
I think we need to recognize those challenges because every kid thinks they're the only one that's not having a happy childhood. No. Well, thank you so much for being on our podcast. It's been absolutely great to have you. I really appreciate that you did say something about the uh, the NDA. And would you be interested in coming back, maybe uh, in the future? What did I say? I thought were you not saying something about uh, you were maybe getting back into the fold? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yes. Well, we'll see. But uh, anyway, uh, that we can always uh, bl blur out. But would you be I, interested? I would be happy to come back in the future if there, if there is a future. Yes. <laughs> well, well, that's that's fine. But you know, we can talk next time. We can talk the trains because that's a pretty cool hobby. I'd like to, I'd love to have you back. And I appreciate you coming on. It was really neat to to, to see the perspective of where children's television has come from and how mental health has changed within our, you know, watching the the kids and the, the youth and it's nice to see that we can kind of bring it back go full circle if we reintroduce that kind of television for kids not by adults for kids anyway i'm gonna let you go Sorry. thank you so much no this has been fantastic i appreciate everything you've done for us it was very good to talk to you and uh yeah if you'd love to come back we'd love to have you back it's uh we're trying to we're growing the podcast it's amazing to talk to people like yourself who have a wealth of experience and just i really look thank forward you. to hopefully seeing that uh resurgence of that kind of fun tv that's not the uh cookie it's cutter also, it's not just fun it's extremely beneficial yeah ryan reynolds on the canada day 2022 was asked to name the 10 best things in canada and for the best tv show he named you canada on television ryan reynolds has spoken before and since about his very difficult childhood with a narcissistic alcoholic father. Really? Comedy helped him get through it. He said so. Well, the comedy was only coming from one source. That's pretty cool. And he named it on the national news, as you can't do that on television. That's a pretty good legacy. And there's one kid now grown up to be an adult who says he still has problems arising from his childhood experience. But we helped him get through it. He didn't join the suicide statistics. The 20.2 child deaths in a year. 20.2% rather. So that's hundreds of children in this country are so desperate to killing themselves. And we've got to do, reach out to them. And you can't give them all psychiatric counseling. You can't reach out to every single one individual in a classroom. Teachers are their own people to do it. Yes, psychotherapy would be the most helpful thing, but they're not going to get that. So give them a chance to see that they're not alone and to laugh at their problems. That's uh, that's one inspirational way to end it. Thank you so much for that. Bye. Sorry. No, thank you. It was great to have you on the podcast, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again, Roger. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. There you have it, folks. Roger Price, what's your thing? So make sure to check us out, whatsyourthingpod.com. Check us out on Instagram, YouTube, follow us on TikTok. Check us out. We're going to have a blast. What's your thing? What's your thing?